On Saturday, July the 1st, 2000, eight-year-old schoolgirl Sarah Payne was snatched from the street in front of her grandparents' house at Littlehampton in West Sussex. For the next fortnight, the whole of the UK was gripped as the police desperately searched for the little girl. Everybody wants to find that child because a missing child is every parent's worst nightmare. But Sarah would never be found. She had been abducted and murdered by a 41-year-old convicted paedophile called Roy Whiting. This was a girl he didn't know who fell into the hands of what could only be described as a monster. Whiting was the number one suspect, but the police had no evidence and had to release him back into the public. I mean, I had nightmares about it. I literally had nightmares over the first few weeks. What happens if he takes the third child? The whole of the UK wanted to see justice served upon Roy Whiting, one of the world's most evil killers. It was a new story that broke hearts across the nation. When the body of Sarah Payne was found on the 17th of July 2000, it brought the search for the eight-year-old girl to a devastating end. She had been missing for over two weeks after being snatched from the street by a known paedophile called Roy Whiting. The search for the blonde schoolgirl had captivated the whole of Britain. Soft, gentle little girl. She hasn't got a horrible bone in her body. Somebody out there must have seen her. They must have seen her on that road. They must have seen her. Sky News anchorman Jeremy Thompson was just one of those following the story. The scale of the search was huge right across the country. Everybody was looking for Sarah Payne, hoping that they might help police to find her. In the end, of course, as so often happens in these sort of cases, the perpetrator was right under the police's nose, just a few miles away from where Sarah Payne had gone missing. It was a case that affected everyone involved, including lead detective Martin Underhill. That picture shows innocence. It also shows happiness. Those eyes, those beautiful eyes that are smiling at you, actually, they show completeness. And all that was taken away. And her photo will live forever. The murderer, 41-year-old Roy Whiting, had long been suspected as her killer. But it took over seven months to gather all the evidence needed to finally put him behind bars. He was a loser, he was a loner, and he'll always be remembered for the wrong reasons, which is, he was a monster who killed a little girl. This killer's story begins almost 60 years ago. Whiting was born on January the 26th, 1959, in Horsham, in West Sussex. And he grew up in nearby Crawley. It was a family that was beset by quite a lot of tragedy. So there were six children, and three of them died in infancy. So an awful lot of trauma to cope with quite early on in his life. Life for the young man didn't get any easier. Whiting's parents, George and Pamela, divorced when he was in his teens. Roy Whiting left school without any qualifications whatsoever. Um, he was somebody who didn't really get along in school. He wasn't particularly academic. Um, he didn't really fit in at all, whether socially or in, in terms of his studies. So he was always a bit of an outcast. Whiting was clearly a bit of an oddball, a loner. Friends described him as a bit of a Billy No-mate. 
When you combine that with the insecure attachments he had within the family, that the lack of relationship with, with his mother, um, the, the disrupted relationship with his father, it does start to, to write a bit of a script. As he entered adulthood, Whiting found a passion for cars, and he began working in a local garage. In 1986, he married a woman he'd met when she was working as an attendant at a petrol station. And they had a child together, but they separated and, and ended up getting divorced. By 1990, 31-year-old Whiting was living alone in his hometown of Crawley. It's pretty clear to me that Whiting developed an increasing interest in young girls, girls in their early years. And he, I'm sure, fought to some extent to control that obsession. Pedophilia is actually a sexual social disorder that manifests itself in, in, in deviant behavior. That's what it is. It's like you have a, a disturbance of sexual disorder in your brain, and instead of doing nothing about it, you go and you, and you attack kids. I think he probably recognized it in himself but didn't quite know how to handle it. And so I think you got that classic mental conflict that afflicts paedophiles and indeed affects serial killers. Part of them thinks, I want to do it, and part of them thinks, no, you mustn't. But Whiting struggled to control his depraved urges. Eyewitnesses, neighbours, people in the vicinity where he lived talked later about how they believed that he was seen quite often scouting for girls, as somebody said, that around school going at home time, it, that he would set off in his van and head off to local schools to see what he could see. So he's probably doing two things at this point in time. He's fantasizing um, about what he would do if he was on his own with one of these children. He's also identifying vulnerabilities. He's getting familiar with, with this, this victim group. He, he really is a predator getting ready to pounce on his prey. At the age of 36, Whiting couldn't resist his urges any longer. On the 4th of March, 1995, he gave in to what you might, I suppose, describe as the wolf within him, and abducted a young girl. He literally scooped her up off the street, took her away to a wooded area where he sexually assaulted her. So this was a really horrendous crime. Soon after the abduction, Whiting had sold his car to avoid detection, but the police soon tracked it down, and forensic evidence within left them with little doubt. It became abundantly clear to the police that this was indeed the car in which the poor girl had been abducted. They arrested and charged Whiting with a sexual attack on a young girl. In June 1995, Roy Whiting was sentenced to just four years in prison for the kidnap and assault of a nine-year-old girl. Before he went to trial, a psychiatrist examined him and came to the conclusion that Whiting was not a paedophile, that this was a one-off event and that he was very unlikely to re-offend. While he was in prison, however, there was a second psychiatric report which suggested that not only was he likely to re-offend again, but he was certain to effectively, that the, this was a man who was obsessed with young girls. Whiting served just two and a half years off his sentence, and in 1997, he was back on the streets, albeit with a mark against his name. He was one of the first people to be placed on what was then a new thing called the Sex Offenders Register. A registered sex offenders have to be known to the police and where they live is important, and there has to be an accurate record of them, and they have to report to the police on a regular basis. Whiting didn't return to Crawley and instead headed for Littlehampton on the south coast of England. 
Well, after leaving prison, Roy Whiting moved to a, a seaside town, um, a town full of families, a town full of children. And this was no accident. And essentially, he tried to blend in on a superficial level in terms of jobs, um, in terms of appearing to be an average guy. But this wasn't going to last because he was very intent that he was going to offend again. They know they can never curb the urge. They can postpone the urge for years, but they will come again and they will attack again. He was quite, uh, I think, ashamed of who he was. Uh, he didn't like himself very much. And he wanted to exert power. He wanted to exert control. And that's what turned him into the predator he became. On July the 1st, 2000, Sarah and Michael Payne had taken their four children to Kingston Gorse in Littlehampton to visit family. It would be a day that would change their lives forever. In the late evening, eight-year-old Sarah was playing with her brothers and sister in a field opposite her grandparents' home when she suddenly vanished. It seemed that Sarah was a few yards behind the others and they were out playing and suddenly they looked round and she was no longer there. She disappeared. It was well into the evening before the family got concerned enough after they'd searched themselves, before they raised the alarm. Sarah's older brother, Lee, told police that he saw a man in a white van speeding away just after losing sight of his sister. There was a real possibility that she'd been snatched. This was something that happened very, very quickly. It was a real blitz abduction. Um, there, there was no grooming, that there was no kind of manipulation. It was something that, that happened very, very fast. The best advice we had was that a child abducted by a paedophile would be dead within six hours. The police had to work fast. They needed to track down the man in the white van. Their hope was he would lead them to the eight-year-old girl and Sarah Payne could be brought home. Her distraught family dialed 999. The call came in at 9 p.m. on a Saturday night, and by 10, the balloon had gone up. And, and that's a policing term for you escalate it right to the top, to the assistant chief constable, the deputy chief constable, the balloon goes up, everybody's called in. And within two hours or so of Payne going missing, there are over 100 cops involved in the case. Officers searched through the night, but by morning, they had no luck. As news broke across the country, the media reached Littlehampton in their droves. It's possible if she moved some distance that, that she could still be hidden somewhere. But we do have to consider uh, there is a growing possibility that actually she has been abducted. Time is still of the essence, and for that reason, we are prioritising that line of inquiry. It was probably 24 hours after the little girl was reported missing that police started to put out word that they were concerned that there was a missing girl, which has the effect of recruiting the general public to be out there as extra eyes and ears to perhaps keep an eye out for this little girl and to search for her. I'm sure in the first 24 hours, most people were looking in the vicinity of the grandparents' home, thinking, well, she's just got herself lost, she's wandered into the woods, she's in the field, or she's wandered off down the road. And it would have been only slowly that the concern would have started to dawn that perhaps she'd been abducted rather than just wandered off and got lost. The police only had one lead to work with. Sarah's 13-year-old brother had seen a man behind the wheel of a white van driving away from the scene of the abduction. He was very clear that Sarah fell over and cut her knee. She ran diagonally across the field to get a, go back to Nana, uh, because Nana was at the end of the field. Uh, her house overlooked it. So Sarah runs across the field. Lee thinks, I'm going to get in trouble because I'm the oldest child. I need to supervise this. Sarah disappeared into a hedge. When Lee came out through the same hedge, seconds later, there was no Sarah and there was a white man driving along the road. As the police searched for potential suspects, the hunt for Sarah continued. 
Within a couple of days, I can remember the, the scale of this story starting to escalate quite rapidly. The way the police were describing this, they were really concerned. In other words, abduction quite quickly had become a possibility. And they were asking the public to help. And uh, very soon, the public around the area in West Sussex were out in quite big numbers, sort of combing fields and woods and uh, trying to look for this girl. Within a couple of hours, we had over 100 police officers involved. And by the Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon, there were 500 police officers involved. And by the Tuesday, so three, three or four days into the, the incident, there were over 1,000 police officers involved. So at one stage, uh, one in three police officers in Sussex were working on this case. It was staggering. Everybody wants to help. Nobody wants to see a child missing. Everybody wants to find that child because a missing child is every family, every parent's worst nightmare. A school photograph of a smiling Sarah Payne was splashed across front pages in a bid to try and find the little girl. That photo of her in her school uniform just swept the world. And uh, I think the there's not many things as a police officer after all the service I've had and the murders I've investigated that shock me. I was really surprised to see so many satellite bands outside of Little Hampton Police Station uh, from Japan, New Zealand, America, Sweden, Norway, every country in the world sent a satellite van to report on this case. As the search continued, the police were focusing their efforts on one suspect in particular, just 24 hours after Sarah Payne's abduction, they had visited with a local man who had been placed on the sex offenders register three years previously, 41-year-old Roy Whiting. We knew where he lived, and he was being regularly visited um, by our uh, sex offender team. Uh, he didn't have a white van, though. He was clearly the, the most appropriate person to look at because of what he did in Crawley a few years before, where he'd abducted a child and then sexually abused her. The only bit of the jigsaw missing was the white van. And of course, when the officers finally traced Whiting on the Sunday afternoon, less than 24 hours after the abduction, there was the white van that no one knew he'd just bought from Southampton. They chatted to him. He said he'd been at a fun fair in Hove, just down the coast, at the time that Sarah went missing, and so he couldn't have possibly been anywhere near the scene. I think that the way that he actually told that lie, the fact he had the confidence to tell that lie, that suggests to me that he thought he was going to get away with this. He thought the police wouldn't dig too deeply. But as they left, they both said, I'm not very happy about this. Let's keep an eye on him and see what he does. And they sat in their police car outside the address. Literally, minutes later, Whiting comes out and goes to the white van and goes to open the door and out falls a receipt. The two detectives immediately got out of their car and headed back towards Whiting for a closer look at the receipt. It was from a petrol station on a road far from Hove, dated Saturday, July the 1st, the day Sarah Payne had been abducted. The receipt clearly shows he lied because the A24 is several miles north of the A27. It's going towards Crawley and it's nowhere near Hove. So that small receipt falling out of the door as the officers stepped up to question him again the second time they've spoken to him, showed, one, he lied about where he was on Saturday night, and two, that he'd been in a different location to where he said he was. And those officers made a very brave decision to arrest him on suspicion of abduction. Police seized the white van for forensic testing, and Whiting was taken in for questioning. But he wasn't telling the detectives anything. We know you're a paedophile, and we know you lied about where you were Saturday night. But of course, we didn't have Sarah. We didn't know if she was alive or dead. We didn't know where she was. Uh, and he was going no comment. So the inevitable happened. We had to release him. Throughout, he doesn't explain at any point to the police, doesn't help the police with their inquiries. He does his best to conceal his guilt. He does in no way tries to alleviate any of the suffering 
that Sarah and Michael Payne were going through. Heartless would be a pleasant way of describing Whiting. At a press conference on Monday, July the 3rd, two days after her disappearance, Sarah Payne's parents made an emotional appeal for her safe return. We need a home now, today, as quickly as we possibly can. She's our life. The thing that impressed everybody and the thing that made people cry in the room was her undying belief her unswerving belief that Sarah was coming home. And every day, in every press briefing, she spoke to Sarah and said, we were coming, we know you're there, we love you. I mean, I'm getting emotional doing it now. And she did that day in, day out for a long time. And it was hugely emotional. And it was also hugely genuine. People saw it for what it was. And it, it, it was incredible, actually. Sarah, if you're watching, mommy, Loves you. And we miss you. And we're looking for you, darling, and we're going to find you. Okay? We're going to find you. Two weeks pass without any sign of Sarah Payne. Chances of finding the missing eight year old girl were becoming slim. As long as there's no news, there's always hope that a child who's vanished will be found again. But as every policeman and expert will tell you, if they're not found within the first 24 or 48 hours, there is a law of diminishing returns. The chances of finding them alive and well start to reduce quite radically. Everybody was desperate that this bonny little child who they'd seen in pictures, who they heard from the parents, They'd heard from her brothers and her sister. They all wanted her to come home safe, but you knew that behind that, people's hopes were, were finding it hard to maintain hope. The longer it goes on, you know that that hope is perhaps ill-founded. The police were certain that convicted paedophile Roy Whiting was responsible for Sarah's disappearance but they had so far found no evidence to link him to the crime. I lost sleep over this. I mean, this is a guy who's abducted a little girl and um, horribly uh, abused her sexually. This is a man who is suspected of abducting and possibly sexually abusing another little girl who could still be alive and we can't find her. And we've got to let him go because there's not enough evidence to charge him. And what happens if he takes a third child? I mean, I had nightmares about it. I literally had nightmares over the first few weeks. But you have to work within the law. And we didn't have enough to charge him. And he was bailed and released. Um, and a few of us held our breath. What's going to happen next? Over a fortnight after the disappearance of eight-year-old Sarah Payne, the police were sure that a local man, Roy Whiting, was responsible for her abduction. But they had no solid evidence to prove it. As the search continued for the missing schoolgirl, breaking news on July the 17th, 2000, confirmed what everyone had been dreading. Then came that day that we'd all feared. I'm sure the whole country had feared. The police announced that they had found the body of what they believed was a child about. 30 feet away from a relatively main trunk road, the A29, partially covered just off a footpath. And I think we all held our breath collectively in news studios, in newsrooms, and around the country, and homes right across the nation, hoping that it wasn't the worst, but fearing that it probably was. The first thing I can confirm with you now is as a result of the post-mortem that was carried out in the early hours of this morning, this is now a murder inquiry. The second thing that you will obviously be wishing to anticipate is that we have been able to identify that the body in the field half a mile from here is Sarah Payne's. That was um, 
a black day for the inquiry and a black day for the country, really, because everyone was still living in hope of a little girl coming home, and she didn't come home. She was found lying dead in a field, and she deserved better than that. Sarah had been found in a shallow grave on the edge of a farmer's field. Experts believe that the, the burial site where Sarah's body was found was dug by Roy Whiting very soon after he'd murdered her. So here is a sexual offender who wants to get this all over with very quickly. And it's almost as if he's, he's just closing that chapter, saying, right, that's done, I'm moving on. There's absolutely no sense of remorse, no sense of empathy with Sarah whatsoever. He's got what he wanted and he's finished. There was no forensic evidence on Sarah's body, so once again, the police were left frustrated. They had a receipt that proved that Roy Whiting was in the region at the time, but that was all. They needed some hard evidence, and a 999 call soon gave them that. The day that um, her body was found, that prompted the lady to pick up the phone and say, I should have told you before, but I saw a child shoe at the Coolum Crossroads, and that shoe transformed the case. This innocuous tip-off led police to the small hamlet of Coolum in West Sussex, just eight miles from where Sarah's body had been discovered. They were certain the shoe could help unlock the case, and about 150 metres from the road where it had first been spotted, they found it discarded in a field. That was a very emotional time because Sarah and her family were just coming to terms with losing Sarah. And then you do what every cop dreads to do, which is walk in with a plastic bag, an evidence bag, and say, I'm sorry, but is this yours? And we realised the significance of what we had. We had a man who was going no comment. We had a man that we just didn't have enough to charge. And suddenly, we found the shoe as a, a direct route from the petrol station to where she was found murdered. Hugely important and very emotional for the family to say, oh my God, that's my daughter's shoe. The small, child size 13 shoe was sent off for forensic testing. Martin was confident they would find something they could use as evidence. It was a Velcro shoe. And Velcro is one of the most aggressive forensic capturers you'll ever find. Um, a piece of Velcro will grab hundreds of things a day. And that's what this did. This strap on this girl's shoe had literally hundreds of fibers, bits of grass, bits of earth, hair. The number one suspect, Roy Whiting, had moved back to his hometown of Crawley and was living with his father. Rumors of his involvement in Sarah's murder had spread like wildfire. By this time, Whiting was known locally as a person of interest in the inquiry, indeed the possible killer of Sarah Payne, whose body has then now been discovered. Vigilantes attack Whiting's father's house. They threw bricks through the window, they uh, shout outside, and so Whiting takes himself off and, of all unlikely things, goes to camp in a tent not all that far from the estate in Crawley where he abducted the girl in 1995. Feeling the pressure, Whiting's next move was a bizarre one. Whiting is clearly tormented. And during this period of the summer of 2000, he decides to steal a car. And then when the police went to stop him, he drove off at speed. Uh, and, in fact, drove down a road the wrong way, and a high-speed chase ensued. Faster and faster, Whiting driving this rather tired Vauxhall as quickly as he can, eventually crashes it into another car. He's caught by the police who chased him, and, of course, is charged with stealing the vehicle. This really is quite kind of out of control. It's, it's quite reckless. And it's because he's not thinking that far ahead. He hasn't actually considered the eventuality that he needs to get away. And when he does realise that that's a possibility, he does the, the most ludicrous things because he, he hasn't got a plan. 
On July the 23rd, 2000, Roy Whiting was arrested and charged with dangerous driving. He would have to remain in custody until his hearing. And that was an amazing moment for me because the risk level, the threat to the public disappeared. And we knew we had him. And all I had to do was keep that man in prison until we could prove he killed or abducted Sarah Payne. Whiting's time in custody would give detectives the chance to build a case against him. They knew that if they were going to arrest him for Sarah's murder, they had to get it right. Whilst he's in prison, police go back and re-examine his white Fiat van. Bear in mind, a white van had been seen in the lane where Sarah had gone missing. And they find in it, eventually, through very, very meticulous forensic testing, a blonde hair. The blonde hair was a 10 million to one shot that it had to be Sarah Payne. There was really very little forensic doubt. The blonde hair discovered on Whiting's sweatshirt was a huge breakthrough in the case, and more strong evidence was still to come from the forensic teams. We found fibres in that shoe which linked Whiting to the shoe and linked the shoe to Sarah. I think it was the icing on the cake for the case. It was the missing piece of the jigsaw. And then we, we had him, and we had him big time. And slowly, they were able to build a strong enough case against Roy Whiting to charge him with the abduction and murder of Sarah Payne. It felt good, actually. I just kept thinking, you can't do this anymore now. We're not going to let you do this anymore, because it's not OK what you did. And then the hard work started. We had to get the case to trial. On February the 6th, 2001, while serving 22 months for the car theft, Roy Whiting was arrested in his prison cell and charged with the abduction and murder of Sarah Payne, seven months after the disappearance of the schoolgirl. Soon after being arrested in Kent this morning, Roy Whiting was driven in a people carrier back to Sussex. As he arrived at Bognor Police Station, an egg was thrown at the vehicle by one of several onlookers. Well, I got home and cried. That was the culmination of months of work to not just deliver for Sarah's family. I'd built a relationship with the Payne family. I respected the Payne family. And they deserved us doing this. They deserved justice. And so lots of emotions going through me. Uh, I've done this for the Payne family. I've also done this for the public, because by charging this monster, we're keeping a third kid safe. But Roy Whiting wasn't going to go down without a fight. The 42-year-old was going to deny all the charges against him. His trial was set for November 2001. He was going to plead not guilty to the murder of Sarah Payne. Detectives hoped that the three key pieces of evidence they had would be enough to convince the jury to put him behind bars forever. When you look at the Coulomb shoe and when you look at the red sweatshirt, I mean, there was a lot of either luck or fluke in the way this case came together because we only found out months into the inquiry that he spent Sunday morning steam cleaning the back of that van. Now, we'll never know, because he's never spoken to us. Why didn't he steam clean the front of the van? If he'd steam cleaned the front of the van as well, the red sweatshirt would have gone, and we would have lost a crucial piece of evidence, arguably the most important bit of evidence against Roy Whiting. And the buck barn receipt, I mean, he could have just thrown that away at the time. The chance of it falling out on the floor and an officer saying, what's that, let me look at it, was incredible. All those three things came together to create a, a pretty convincing piece of evidence, but it's never lost on me that actually all those three things could have disappeared and we would never have solved that case. Prosecutor Timothy Langdale QC came up against a wall of denial from Whiting. Well, his defence, to put it bluntly, was, I didn't do it and I've no idea what, how there would be a hair of Sarah Payne's on anything in my van. 
and I'm not responsible for her death. The judge had ruled the jury were not allowed to know about Whiting's previous conviction for sexual abuse on a child in 1995, which made the case against him harder to prove. It was an emotional 19 days in the courtroom. I think one of the most moving moments of the trial was when it was put to him that effectively he threw this poor, innocent girl into the back of a white Ducato van, which he turned into a moving prison. It defies imagining what she must have suffered. There is no possible way anyone could forgive that kind of atrocity, that kind of depraved behavior. This was a girl he didn't know, entirely innocent, cheerful, smiling, as every picture always showed her, who fell into the hands of what could only be described as a monster. After nine hours of deliberation, on Wednesday, December the 12th, 2001, the jury had reached their decision. Roy Whiting was guilty of the murder of Sarah Payne. I can't believe for one moment that had he got off the killing of Sarah Payne, he wouldn't have returned to the same modus operandi he'd used in 1995 and 2000. It would have been a tragedy. The four-week trial was torturous for the Payne family who were in the courtroom throughout. The pressure, in particular, on Sarah's mother, Sarah Payne, must have been enormous hearing all this evidence about the terrible death of her daughter and having to sit there and listen to Whiting. And one member of the family I seem to remember, and again, one can perhaps hardly blame him, said, may you rot in hell, or something to that effect. But that was the only time anybody gave vent to any kind of emotional response. And that was after Whiting had been convicted. On December the 12th, 2001, Judge Mr Justice Curtis sentenced Whiting to life imprisonment. He was sent to Wakefield Prison. It was only after the trial that Whiting's previous conviction was read out to the court. The judge said he'd be recommending that Whiting be kept in prison for the rest of his life. This was met by the loudest cries of yes in court. Whiting was taken away to begin that sentence tonight. This doesn't make us happy, but justice has been done. Sarah can rest in peace now. But let's make sure that this stops happening time and time again. It's always shocking to think that somebody can be convicted of an act as awful as a paedophile attack. To be put away in prison, to be put on the sexual offenders register, and yet to be free to harm again, not that long afterwards. Five years later, surely our system is better than that, that it should better prevent these repeat offences as Whiting managed to carry out. The reverberations surrounding the tragic murder of Sarah Payne can still be felt today. One thing I think in the news we tend to forget about is the aftermath of these terrible cases. And it was a long time afterwards you start to be more aware of the tragic impact that a child's abduction and murder has on all those around them, the whole family, probably friends as well, traumatized by it, never to be the same. And in the case of the pains, Sarah, the mother, appeared to be very strong and pushed through her great political campaign to get legislation changed. And to have something in this country called Sarah's Law, which was the equivalent to an American device called Megan's Law. In other words, you had the right to know where registered sex offenders lived in your area. And Sarah Payne's mother campaigned, with the help of the News of the World, to introduce this right. But it seemed that in the struggle to do that, to compensate for the loss of her child, that immense pressures were put on the marriage with Michael, and eventually he had problems with 
alcoholism, mental issues, depression. And sadly, Michael left us too early. And there's no doubt about it that the contribution of Sarah's abduction of Whiting's murder of his daughter and the stresses and strains that produced uh, led to his early death. I hope he's, he's now with Sarah. Sarah's mother had a stroke, now walks with some considerable difficulty, and has throughout behaved with the most enormous dignity and complete grace to this utterly poisonous man. I think her behaviour has been exemplary. I have uh, the utmost respect for Sarah. She was incredible, and my admiration for her in the way she steered her family, her children, and her friends through this was incredible. The abduction and murder of Sarah Payne has become one of the most infamous crimes in British history. I think murders like this, the, the murder of Sarah Payne, capture so much attention because this could have been anybody's child, anybody's sister, yeah, anybody's daughter. Um, and it's that, that idea of risk, that idea of stranger danger as being something that really feeds into the paranoia of parenting in contemporary society. It was a watershed because it changed the way the police and society looked at the child abduction. I think it really brought the horror of child abduction into everyone's house for the first time. It was about the time that 24-7 TV arrived and it was a massive case and it still is actually. People still talk about the Sarah Payne case. It's changed history. Her legacy is that a lot of children now are safer than they were in 2000. And that's a hell of a legacy for any person. Since Roy Whiting has been in prison, he's been viciously attacked on two occasions by fellow inmates. He will be eligible for parole in 2041 at the age of 82. I tend to think of him as being more pathetic than evil, but in the end, he did the most evil of acts. He killed another human being, and in this case, he killed an eight-year-old girl. There are a few worse crimes in our society. So he will go down as an evil man. I think the family need closure, even now. They would want to know what happened to their daughter. There are various unanswered questions. I don't think Warren Whiting will ever speak now. And I hope he rots in hell. The whole of Britain was heartbroken when the body of eight-year-old Sarah Payne was found in July 2000. Everyone had hoped she would return home safe, but there was to be no fairy tale ending. Thanks to persistent police work, Roy Whiting is now behind bars, and the memory and the legacy of Sarah Payne will long outlive her sick killer.